guys! Today we are going to talk about bacteria, which is one of my favorite topics. I just think they're super fascinating. And I'm going to show you how I made a model of bacteria from simple materials and then challenge you to do the same thing. If you haven't already, go ahead and print this handout from the video description. It looks slightly different from what I have here for my students. It just has a bigger header. But right underneath this video, if you look at the description, there is a link to the Google Doc. It's double-sided. It also includes the take-home lab activity uh, that you can do at home. And my students, you'll find that in Google Classroom. So let's look at the model. I'm going to challenge you guys to make a model from simple ba simple bacteria, <laughs> simple materials that you can find at home, and this is my model of a bacteria cell. So let's look at what it looks like, first of all, in my notes. Okay, this is more what a representation of a bacteria cell usually looks like. Most of them are rod-shaped, and they're called bacillus bacteria, which comes from the root meaning rod or stick. So, as you can see from my model, the first thing that's not totally accurate is the shape. None of them are cube-like structures, but models don't have to be perfect to teach us something. So when you talk about your model, you'll talk about the ways in which it is and is not like an actual bacteria cell. So let's start with this outer portion of my cell quote. If we look back here, you can see this purple outline. That purple outline is the outermost part of a bacteria cell and it is called the capsule or the outer membrane. I have represented the capsule or outer membrane with this hard styrofoam box and the reason I like it is because capsule actually comes from the root meaning box. It is sort of like a box around the cell although it's really rod shaped and I like it because I can close it and it really does go all the way around the cell. What I wish were different is that it was more shaped like a rod and it would stay closed better because it wants to pop open. Um, but in many ways, it really is like a capsule. A bacterium's capsule or outer membrane makes it more virulent or deadly. And it does this, it protects it from white blood cells that might want to attack the bacterium. And it also keeps it from drying out. So the capsule is a very important part of the bacteria's structure. We'll come to some of these other outer parts in a minute, but I want to open it up. So I'm reducing, reusing, recycling an Edvotech kit that I got here. And as you can see, the capsule is very thick. So here's my capsule, but it's not the only layer. Humans don't have a capsule. And we also don't have this next layer, which is the cell wall. Plants have a cell wall, bacteria have a cell wall, humans don't have a cell wall. We do have the innermost layer, which is the cell membrane. It's also called the plasma membrane. So let's go back over here to the diagram. On the diagram, you can see the capsule is purple. Then there's the cell wall in yellow. And then there's the plasma membrane or cell membrane on the inside. So these are three layers to protect this cell. And like I said, humans only have the plasma membrane. We don't have the other two. So let's talk about what these parts are for. The capsule, like I said, that outermost layer is to keep it from drying out, protect it from white blood cells. This cell wall part is mostly to help the cell keep its shape because bacteria are single cells and they need to maintain that shape. So it would be better if this were a stiffer material. Mine's actually quite flexible, but the cell wall itself would be very rigid, much more like this. Um, but it is in the middle of the two, so that's good in terms of representation. The innermost layer is the plasma membrane, which I have represented by cardboard. All of these I wish were more like an oval. Instead, they're blocky, but that's what I had. The plasma membrane serves the same role in a bacterium that it does in a human cell. It's semi-permeable, which means some things can go through and some things can't. So it lets things the cell needs in, it gets waste out, it keeps dangerous things from coming in, and that's the purpose of a cell membrane, whether it's in a human or a bacterial cell. Now let's look at what's inside the cell. So all the important parts that we think of as being um, organelles are inside the cell membrane. 
And if you think about a human cell inside of us, inside of each of our cells, we have a nucleus. Bacteria don't have a nucleus. Inside our nucleus is our DNA in the form of chromosomes. Bacteria don't have a nucleus, but they do have a chromosome. But they only have one, and it's this tangly thing called a nucleoid. You should say nucleoid. Make sure you know how to say these words, nucleoid. And that nucleoid is one chromosome. Each bacteria just has the one chromosome. And like I said, it's tangled up. Now let's look back at my drawing. So in my diagram, the nucleoid looks like this. It's pretty big compared to some of the other things inside of the cytoplasm. And you can see it's just one big piece of DNA. It is important to note that it is DNA, so this is where the genetic code of the bacterium is. Now let's look back. The inside of the cell is filled with something called cytoplasm. I've represented that with these little safflower seeds that I like to feed to the birds. It's kind of a good representation because it fills the space and I can put other things in it and kind of hide them in there. But in a cell, the cytoplasm is actually more of a jelly-like fluid. And it's just what holds all the other organelles. So the organelles float in the cytoplasm, kind of helps them hold their position. Now let's look at these big guys. These are representing the ribosomes. We have ribosomes just like a bacterium does. And ribosomes, no matter what kind of organism they're in, they are the protein factories. So the ribosomes assemble amino acids into proteins. And the bacterium has quite a few of these inside the cell. And they're all working to turn the DNA code into proteins, just like inside of a human cell. Now let's look at my diagram. On my diagram, I represented the ribosomes as these little double circles because ribosomes are really kind of two balls attached if you look at them and you check out their molecular structure. So they're a little more like the actual shape here. I thought about making each ribosome two balls connected together, but then I thought I want you to be able to make a really simple model. It doesn't have to be perfect. So I'm going to represent that with my model. The next really important thing and the last thing we're going to talk about that's in here is these little rings. And these little rings are DNA, just like the nucleoid is DNA, but these are a kind of DNA that we don't have. They're not chromosomes. They are called plasmids, and plasmids are one of the coolest things you can find in a bacteria, in my opinion. So they're these tiny rings of DNA. That's really cool because it means that the bacteria has a big nucleoid with DNA code, but it also has these tiny plasmids with DNA code. And that's going to be really important for some of bacteria's sort of superpowers that it has, which we'll come back to. So for now, you need to make a note that these are little rings of DNA. If you look at my diagram, you'll see there's only one nucleoid, but there are many plasmids. So each bacterium has one nucleoid, but numerous plasmids inside of its cytoplasm. Now let's come to the things that are on the exterior of the cell. These tubes, these hollow plastic tubes, are the pili. And pili is plural for pilus. The pili are hollow protein tubes. And they are something that not all bacteria have. It's pretty cool if bacteria do have them because they let bacteria stick to surfaces. And that's one of the things that they do. But they do another thing that we make use of in our class that I think is super cool. And we have a lab coming up that involves this. Bacteria can actually pass their plasmids from one bacterium to the next through their pilus. It's called a sex pilus when they do that. So if I had another bacterium bumping up against this one, they could basically squirt plasmids into each other. And that's amazing because that lets them pass their genetic material from one to the next. I just think that's incredible because what if I could take a trait that someone else had that I wanted and I could just walk up and touch them and they could pass that trait into me or I could pass some trait into them. Bacteria are actually able to do that. 
although they're not really intentional about it. It's pretty random what they pass to each other. So if you look at my diagram, I represented the Peely with these blue highlighter sticks coming off of it. Remember, not all bacteria have this. It comes from a root meaning hair-like, and so they are sort of like hairs, but they're hollow. And again, it's important to note that plasmids can pass through these so that one bacterium can pass a gene to another one. The next thing we're going to talk about is the flagella. And flagella comes from the root word meaning tail or whip. So you can probably guess that this pink thing is the flagella. Not all bacteria have a flagella. That's kind of a special adaptation that some of them have. And I really like what I picked to represent this. It's just an iPhone cord. Uh, it was injured at some point, so it's been repaired. And it's just coming out of the cell. And it whips around like a tail and lets the, lets the bacterium have motility or move on its own. So it can whip its tail around in a fluid environment and propel itself forward. The most analogous structure I can think of is a sperm uh, the tail on a sperm. Now we're going to talk about this glitter that you see in the cell wall. This glitter represents the endotoxins. If we look at my diagram, the endotoxins are represented by little stars. Endotoxins are found in the outer membrane or the capsule, and they are only found in gram-negative bacteria. You should make a note of that, because if you're one of my students, we'll get into gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria first. But endotoxins are part of what make bacteria that are pathogenic really deadly to us. Make sure that you have filled in your notes about all the different parts of a bacterium cell. And then I challenge you to take the model that I made and create your own model. And you can be super creative. Use anything. Your car could be the capsule, for example. Um, but be creative. Models are a great way to help us better understand things. And then my students, you're going to make a video for me where you explain your model just like I explained mine. You don't have to say what each of the parts does, but I do want you to go through and explain how they represent those parts, how they're accurate, and how they could be improved. Thank you for joining me to learn a little bit about bacteria. I hope this helped you, and I would love to see your models. If you're one of my students, you will turn them into me, but if not, maybe drop a picture down in the comments so I can see what you come up with for your bacteria model.